What's up everyone, Keir the Rugby Strength Coach. Today's video we're going to talk about energy system development. Uh, a few of you have sent in questions via the Facebook page and also the Twitter page asking me to do a video on this. Uh, so I'm going to talk all about my ideas behind energy system development for rugby. I tried to do this video the other day uh, and I stuck it in the bin about five times. Firstly because I was really sunburnt from the beach and secondly because I could see it turning into like a 30-40 minute video. Uh, it's a, energy system development is a massive topic. So what I've decided to do now that I'm less red is to tackle this in two installments. In the first installment, what I'm going to do is kind of outline my philosophy on what I believe we should be doing within a conditioning program for rugby. And in the second part of the video, I'm going to lay it all out and tell you what I think you should be doing in terms of organizing the training to maximize your performance on the rugby field. So before we get into the philosophy, we're going to talk about the, the, the science of energy systems really, really quick. We have three energy systems which allow us to produce energy and perform work on the rugby field. The first one is the aerobic system. We have two more systems which are anaerobic in nature, named the glycolytic or lactic acid system and the alactic system. Now the aerobic system is the most sustainable system that we have. This system can run indefinitely without running out of fuel and without having to stop due to byproducts that are created. When you're at rest, you're using almost entirely the aerobic system, and when you're performing exercise at below lactate threshold intensities, again, you're using predominantly the aerobic system. And if you think about an event which heavily taxes the aerobic system, like for example a marathon, you can see that the aerobic system is able to sustain many hours of activity uh, without running out of fuel. The glycolytic system is a more powerful system. It allows you to exercise at much higher intensities than you would be able to do with the aerobic system. However, a downside of this is that the glycolytic system produces byproducts which inhibit the body and force it to stop exercising and switch down to lower intensity and rely again on the aerobic system. So it has more power than the aerobic system, but much less sustainability than the aerobic system. If we think about an event which heavily taxes the glycolytic system, like for example a 400 meter race, you can see that athletes are able to sustain about 45 to 60 seconds of activity before they have to stop or decrease their intensity. The final system is the alactic system. This is the most powerful of all systems and it's able to sustain maximal activity for around six to 12 seconds maximum. And when we think about events which heavily tax the alactic system, like jumps, throws, or a 100 meter race, you can see that again, it's much more intense than what we're able to sustain with the aerobic and the glycolytic system. However, like we've said, it's the least sustainable of those systems. Now getting to the philosophy side of energy system development, I really like an idea that I got from Martin over at Complementary Training. And he said that the idea behind a conditioning program for any sport is to do two things. One is to increase the intensity of sporting movement, and two is to increase the repeatability and sustainability of sporting movement. So in, in plain English, you need to be able to do what you're doing as fast and as powerful as possible to try and beat your opponent and equip yourself with the biggest chances of success in the field. But you need to be able to do that more often and you need to be able to do it for longer. If you can't do that, you might be great in the first minute, but you're gonna suck from minute two to minute 80. And obviously, uh, a balance between those two factors is probably gonna equip you with the greatest chances of success on the field. Now, just looking at those three energy systems that we've already talked about, you can see straight away that the glycolytic system in the middle is neither the most intense, nor the most sustainable, nor the most repeatable of those systems. Obviously, the alactic system is the most powerful and intense, and the aerobic system is a lot more sustainable and repeatable than either of the other two systems. And this kind of gives you a hint about what my philosophy is for energy system development for rugby, and that is, that we need to become as least reliant as possible on the glycolytic system and try and maximize our development of the aerobic system and of the alactic system. And this is kind of in contrast to what a lot of rugby strength and conditioning coaches think. And I believe they, they come to this conclusion uh, just looking at how unfit players play the game of rugby. They'll look at an unfit player, uh, they'll see that this guy has produced a ton of lactic acid, he's relying heavily on that system Eventually, it becomes too much. He's produced too many byproducts which inhibit his ability to use that system, and he has to stop. Or he has to get subbed off, or he has to lower his intensity where he can start using the aerobic system again. Coaches look at this example and think, well, he's used the glycolytic system heavily. 
what we need to do is train him how to use that system better to increase his ability to keep sustaining that effort for as long as possible uh, and then we'll sub him off. My belief is we should be doing the opposite. We should teach him to become less reliant on that glycolytic system. And to illustrate this, I kind of used like a, a thought experiment. Imagine if you take an international rugby player, let's say for example, George North, and you take him from, you know, he's, he's in the autumn internationals right now, we'll, we'll take him out of that, and we'll stick him into a national league level two game in England. If we put him in that league two game, do you think he's gonna produce more lactic acid or less lactic acid in that game than he would an international? And the obvious answer is that he's probably gonna produce less lactic acid and it's gonna be easier for him. And the reason for that is, is that he's so well developed in his aerobic system and his alactic system relative to the demands of the game that he doesn't need to tap into that system. And as a consequence, his activity becomes more intense, more powerful, more sustainable and more repeatable. And essentially that's what I try and do in my rugby energy system development programs. I'm trying to make players less reliant on that glycolytic system so that we can be like George North in the National League 2 game. Now this is not to say that you're never going to use the glycolytic system in rugby. Obviously rugby is a very, very unpredictable game and sometimes we can have to work for a lot longer or a lot faster than we expect to during a game. And obviously in these instances, we are going to deplete the alactic system or we are going to rise above the intensity of the aerobic system for too long and we're going to be forced to use the glycolytic system. However, there are a bunch of reasons why I think we still shouldn't train the glycolytic system when we're preparing the energy systems for Rugby Union or Rugby League. And I'm just going to talk about a few of these now before talking about the structure of the programming in the second part of the video. The first thing I think we need to think about is the pattern of play in rugby. What we see from GPS is that we're performing a maximal intensity effort of about three to four seconds duration about every minute or so uh, during the game. Now if we look at one of these bouts of activity in isolation, it's logical and obvious that we should be able to sustain that activity with the alactic system when we perform our high intensity activity and with the aerobic system when we perform the sub-maximal activity of 60 seconds. And we know that in three to four seconds, we're not going to tap out the alactic system. We're going to have some anaerobic reserves, some creatine phosphate in reserve that we can use for subsequent bouts. And we know that during that 60 seconds of sub-maximal activity, so long as we're below our lactate threshold, we're going to be able to resynthesize more creatine phosphate for future high intensity efforts. And we're going to be able to repeat that pattern of activity of high intensity and sub-maximal again and again and again until eventually we run out of creatine phosphate and then we have to switch to the glycolytic system for a high intensity activity. Now I would make the case that the more capacity we have within the alactic system and the higher the lactate threshold, the further down the line we're going to push that scenario and the more we're going to be able to produce high intensity sustainable outputs relying on the alactic and aerobic systems. And this is what the science suggests when we look at repeat sprint studies. Uh, in one study that I'm particularly fond of, they took two groups of athletes. They took aerobically trained athletes and field sport athletes and required them to perform 10 series of three second sprints on the minute, every minute for 10 minutes. What was found was that there was no significant difference between either group of athlete for the maximal power or speed that they were able to achieve in any of the repeat sprints. Where there was a big difference was in the ability of the athletes to sustain the same power output from rep to rep to rep over the 10 sprints. And as you can guess, the aerobically trained endurance athletes were able to sustain their power output for far longer than the field sport athletes. And in fact, what the researchers saw was that the field sport athletes who were most reliant on their glycolytic system actually experienced the biggest drop in power output across the sprints. So they would be an example of that player who is fantastic in minute one or minute two, but then starts to go downhill rapidly. But my belief is that if we can create athletes who are more reliant on the aerobic system, they're gonna be there or thereabouts in terms of the maximal power that they can achieve, but far more sustainable in their pattern of activity. Now a second finding from this study was that there was a progressively higher aerobic component uh, from the energy system contribution to those sprints with each sprint. The more sprints the athletes did, the more they used the aerobic system. Now I think if we know that that's coming, we need to train for that and maximize the contribution of the aerobic system to allow for these changes. If we train our athletes to focus on the glycolytic energy system, we're actually working against that 
and when we do eventually have to switch to higher aerobic metabolism as the number of sprints we perform goes on, uh, we're going to perform uh, worse and worse. And that's within the context of only 10 sprints performed in 10 minutes. If you think about the pattern of playing rugby, we're performing two 40 minute halves which are probably going to be in a similar vein. So the contribution of the aerobic system in that instance is going to be much, much higher than we've seen in that particular study. Second reason that I don't think we should focus too much on a glycolytic system in uh, ESD for rugby is two things. One is the trainability and two is the rate of adaptation within the glycolytic system. If you look at the research, what it suggests is that the glycolytic system is extremely hard to train and improve with training. Uh, that is, you can put a ton of effort, a ton of time into training that system and you're still only going to see small percentage increases, you know, maybe 5-10%. to 10 Conversely, if you can dedicate more time and effort in your training to developing the aerobic system, you're able to see massive increases in performance within the aerobic system and massive adaptations. Certain adaptations within uh, the aerobic system, you're able to double their adaptation. So for example, chamber size within the heart. Now to me, that offers a far better return on investment of training effort if we're able to increase performance using the aerobic system than the glycolytic system. The second factor that I alluded to is how long you can train and improve the glycolytic system for. People are very, very fond to quote the Tabata study as evidence that we should be training the glycolytic system or the anaerobic energy systems uh, for sport. However, if you delve more deeply into the findings of that study, you'll see that the anaerobic group actually tapped out their adaptation uh, several weeks before the end of the study had concluded. They'd been able to improve the anaerobic glycolytic system as much as possible, and then it actually stopped and it wasn't improving anymore. Conversely, the aerobic group in that study were able to improve their aerobic performance and the contribution of that energy system from week to week to week throughout the study, and they were still improving when the study concluded. Another reason I think that we need to focus on the alactic system and the aerobic system is the compatibility between those two training systems. We know from rugby that we're going to need to perform maximal intensity efforts because if I work at submaximal intensity and you work at maximal intensity, when we're squaring off against one another on the field, it's obvious that you're going to win. You're going to be more powerful and uh, you're going to beat me. So we both have to use the alactic system to try and equip ourselves with the biggest chance of success. We know as well that we're going to tap into our creatine phosphate reserves. We're going to deplete the substrate that's available for that system. Now, what system do we have to use to resynthesize that system? And it is the aerobic system. We need a well-developed aerobic system to resynthesize creatine phosphate and equip us to perform high intensity activity down the line. The better developed our aerobic system is, the faster and more efficiently we're going to be able to resynthesize creatine phosphate. If we're less aerobically developed, we're going to have less creatine phosphate for the next high intensity activity, we're going to run out of fuel sooner, and then we're going to switch to the less powerful and less sustainable glycolytic system. Likewise, if we train the aerobic system to become as developed as possible, in the event that we do produce lactate using the glycolytic system, a well-developed aerobic system is going to allow us to metabolize that lactate a lot quicker, reduce those byproducts which inhibit activity, and actually allow us to utilize the glycolytic system uh, for longer and more often than if we don't have that level of aerobic development. Now you can make the case that you could do that just by training the glycolytic system directly. However, a couple of things why I think this is a bad idea. One is that there's a suggestion from the literature that if we produce extremely high levels of lactate, we're actually going to inhibit our ability to develop mitochondria within the aerobic system and that is going to harm our development of the aerobic system which we've established that we need. Likewise, if we're training the glycolytic system, what we're probably going to see is a decline in the peak power output of the alactic system which again we've established we need. So if we're training the glycolytic system, it's likely that we're going to have a detrimental effect on the other two energy systems. However, if we train the alactic system and the aerobic system together, what we're going to see is a complementary effect between the two. And a final reason I would say not to focus on the glycolytic system is the effect that the glycolytic system has on interrupting the high-low pattern of training. Uh, if you want to read about high-low training, just go onto my blog and check out a great article by uh, Will Swan who's outlined high-low training for rugby. Going into more detail of high-low, generally what happens is when you add an activity on a high training day, you have to remove a training activity from that day elsewhere. If we start to add in glycolytic work in a high-low program, it will come at the expense of alactic speed work because once we increase one component, we have to decrease the other. Now, 
I've already said that my belief is that speed is the most important physical activity of all on the rugby field. And if we're sacrificing uh, speed for something else, I think that is a mistake, particularly when we've made the case against training the glycolytic system for rugby so much. I'm going to stick this at the end because I don't have any studies to confirm it. Uh, within rugby, but this is my belief about uh, elite rugby performers. And anyway, in my experience, you're probably going to get some glycolytic energy system training at some point within the rugby practice. Uh, this is because rugby coaches sometimes get carried away, and uh, once we start to get into those contact practices before we've developed the ability to kind of spend our energy more efficiently, we're probably going to get some training effect on the glycolytic system, uh, particularly as the season approaches. So I think just training for rugby as we do normally within the context of a high-low system, we're probably going to get the optimal development of all three energy systems that we need. A couple of final points here that don't relate directly to performance on the field, more towards the training process. Uh, this is from my own experience and also from speaking to other coaches, most notably Dave Tenney from Seattle Sounders in uh, Major League Soccer. Uh, and that is that more aerobic athletes tend to suffer less non-contact injuries on the field of play and the athletes who are more dominant and uh, more reliant within that glycolytic system, they tend to suffer more non-contact injuries, stuff like strains, uh, muscle pulls and so on. And as we've already established in previous uh, articles and videos on the site, injury prevention is the most important physical ability within the program because if we're injured, we can't perform, we can't win. A second thing uh, is that athletes who are more aerobically developed and less reliant within that glycolytic system are able to recover uh, from session to session more quickly in my experience. And obviously the more often we're able to train, the bigger a training stimulus we're going to deliver to the body and hopefully the more we're going to adapt and improve on the field of play. So those are the two final reasons that I would say I'm a big fan of favouring the aerobic and alactic systems within energy system development for rugby. Now if you like this video make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel so you'll get a message automatically when part 2 of the instalment comes up. Likewise please like and share this video so it gets to the biggest audience as possible and I'll put up part 2 of this video next week. In the meantime if you want more information please go to www.rugbystrengthcoach.com.